thank you for tuning in and for showing your interest in the Word of God. We certainly aim to present our God's Word as He has given it to us, and we appreciate your interest in that. Pray that you will find this to be beneficial, that you will be able to take these things into your life to be shaped by God that he might make us into the people that he has declared we ought to be. And that, that is our aim. We want to be shaped by God and I hope that you will find this beneficial in your walk with him. That you may begin that walk if you haven't and that you may grow in that walk if you, you have. And that is what we want to do. It has been suggested to me, and I do think that it is a very good suggestion, and so I do want to implement it, that I begin or, or end these lessons with a prayer. And so here in just a moment, we are going to go to God in prayer but before we do that, I just want to, to make a note to offer maybe a small reminder that each of us individually and privately, that we go to God in prayer on our own, that, that each and every one of us send our prayers up. To God. And I hope that everyone is doing that, that each of us find ourselves with a, a rich prayer life to God as we walk with Him. That being the case, though, I do want to begin with a prayer, and I do hope that you will pray with me. Let us pray. Holy God, you are so good and so wonderful, and we are full of praise for you. We cannot help, Father, as we consider who you are and your qualities, to heap praise upon you and to offer up ourselves in sacrifice of all towards you. And we pray, our God, that as we do so, that it is pleasing in your sight. Thank you, our God, for giving us your word, that we can see your great power and your great wisdom in establishing your plan and bringing it to fruition in your Son. Thank you for his willingness to come and to submit himself fully to your will to die even the death on the cross and we praise your power, Father, in raising him up, and exalting him, and setting him on high. Help us, Father, to be shaped, to look like him, to follow in his footsteps, that we will submit ourselves fully to your will, that in that humbling we may be exalted by you. Thank you for showing us how we can live lives that are pleasing towards you. And thank you for giving us the power, for giving us the strength that we are able to live this way. As we think on the things that you have revealed in your word, Father, we pray that you will help us in understanding. We pray that you will help us to see the lessons that you are teaching to us. And we pray that you will help us in wisdom, Father, that we will be able to take this knowledge, apply it in every aspect of our lives. And we pray that you will help us to be courageous so that whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, whoever we find ourselves surrounded by, that we will always be willing to stand up and declare you as our God, and to declare your word as the truth. We pray, Father, that your will will be done in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. As we jump
jump right into the lesson here, as you can see from the screen, I want to talk to you about the four, four soils. In Matthew 13, looking at the first nine verses, we'll get to that in just a moment. Hope that you will open up your Bibles to Matthew 13. Hope that you have a Bible in front of you, whether that be on a screen electronically or in print in a book. Hope that you have God's Word in front of you, that we can look at these things together, as I said just a moment ago. That is our aim, that is our goal, getting into the Word of God. As we get into what we know as the parable of the sower, that is what Jesus is going to refer to it in just a moment in our reading as, I want to point out though that the story itself is not really about the sower. It is about the soils that the sower is putting the seed into. And so as we get into looking at this parable that Jesus provides and talking about it, our aim and our focus is looking at the soils, thinking about them. And as we think about the different kind of soil, which is to say the different kind of hearts in accepting the word of God, we begin to ask ourselves the question. And it is a question that we need to ask very seriously with a, a great depth of self-examination, what kind of soil am I? So Matthew 13, beginning in verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he went into a boat and sat down. And the, excuse me, and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and he sowed. Some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And then as you continue on in the story, the disciples come and they ask him why he speaks to the people in parables, and Jesus tells them that they are blessed because these things have been given to them to understand, but to others, these things have not been given to understand. And then as you read a little bit further into the text, Jesus makes clear what he means. He does not mean that these disciples are somehow given miraculously to understand the point that he is making, and others have not been chosen to understand these things, but rather these people have closed their eyes. They've stopped up their ears, seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear. They're not willing to look for and see the truth in the message that Jesus is presenting. Whereas these disciples who come to Jesus, who are looking for the truth in the message that he is presenting, and ask him, what is this about? We don't understand. We don't get this. Can you explain this to us? then it is given to them to understand these things, whereas those who willingly remain in their ignorance, those who willingly decide not to look for the truth in what Jesus is presenting are going to not receive these things. They're not going to understand and see and know what Jesus is presenting. But then after explaining all of this to them, the disciples once more remember that what was that about? We don't quite understand that. And in verse 18, Jesus picks up explaining that parable to them. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the 
evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. And so Jesus explains the parable to them and everything that that goes along with that. As we get into it then, let's begin with the soil that fell on the path. Now the path within the parable, drawing on the, the, the real world illustration, the path is the part of the field that the farmer walks on. It's not filled up, it's not made ready, it's parred down packed dirt so that when seed is thrown on it, it does not get down into the dirt. It sits up on the surface, and you can see within the story sitting up on the surface, then the birds come in and they take that seed away. It did not get down into the soil, and so it's unplowed soil that the farmer is, is using to get around the field. It's soil that has not been prepared. It has not been made ready. And Jesus says then, when he explains the parable, that this soil are those who have not been made ready. They have not been prepared to understand it. And in the section that we kind of skipped over that I summarized of verses 10 through 17, Jesus explains why they have not been made ready, because they have dulled their ears, because they have closed their eyes. Look with me in verses 14 and 15. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For, because this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Their heart has not been made ready. It has not been prepared to accept the seed, to accept the word of the kingdom, or as Luke's gospel refers to the seed, the word of God. That that path is unplowed. It's hard. It's unwilling to accept the seed into it. That's a heart that has not been made ready. They have closed up their ears. They have closed their eyes. They have hardened their hearts. The soil of their heart is not willing to accept seed. They have not properly studied the word. They have not properly dug into the truth that the truth might dig into them. You see that happening. Peter talks about this in his second letter. In 2 Peter 3, at the end of his letter, he talks about some things that are hard to understand. He says that Paul has written things that are difficult to understand. No, not impossible to understand. Difficult, hard to understand. And there are people who take these things and they twist them to their destruction. And the category of people, he says, that, that twist these things to their own destruction, he says that they are ignorant and unstable. And so they're without proper knowledge. 
knowledge. They do not have the knowledge within them. They are ignorant and they are unstable. Which is to say the foundation upon which they stand is not rock solid. The foundation upon which they stand is not the truth. And so they have it dug in, in order to get a proper foundation in which to build a building that's going to be able to stand. They are unstable. They haven't dug into the truth. They haven't dug until they found the rock upon which to build. And so in that instability, and so in that ignorance, that they twist these things. Hard heart, with an unwillingness to accept what God says, things get thrown on them. But then Satan comes and he just snatches that seed away. Does not let that seed get down into the heart. And notice that Satan didn't do that outside of the choice of the soil. Satan did not do that in a way in which the soil had no choice. Satan was able to do that because that soil, that heart, that person made the decision that their heart would not be prepared, would not be made ready in order to accept the seed of God. And then because that person, that soil made that decision. Satan was able to come in. He's able to snatch that seed away. We need to prepare our minds. We need to prepare our hearts to accept God's word. To accept God's seed. Preparing, girding up the, the loins of your mind, Peter writes about in his first letter. That's the ideal. Girding up your loins is the ideal that when they, they wear these loose, flowy clothing that, that war could not be uh, accomplished in, that hard tasks could not be accomplished in, and it would be tied up, it, it would be made so that then the, the difficult task could be accomplished. And so preparation was made going into these tasks, girding up the loins. Well, Peter uses that imagery, that language, gird up your mind, make your mind ready for the task that is ahead of you. Don't be the unprepared soil. Be the soil that's made ready to accept God's word. Now let me point this out. We love to make this point about irreligious and unreligious people. That they are the ones with a hard heart. They're the ones who are unwilling to accept the word of God. And that's true enough. They are the ones with a hard heart. They are the ones who are unwilling to accept the word of God. But you remember when I opened up the thought that this requires some self-examination, some looking at ourselves. We find ourselves religious. But here's the question. Have we become hard-hearted? This is my view, not because it comes from seed of God, not because it's the fruit that he is born, but it's because so-and-so, who was a really good man, and I really trust him, told me that. But because it's written down in this book, it's a good book, a lot of good stuff in it, but it's not found in this we, we religious people, need to make sure that our hearts are not hardened in our own viewpoint, but that our hearts have been softened, have been prepared to accept 
the word of God, lest the truth of God's word lays on a hard heart, and Satan comes and he snatches it away, because that particular piece of truth is inconvenient for us. Secondly, we find the rocky soil in verses 5 and 6. This is, typically when I read this, I think of a soil that has rocks and things mixed into it. But from my understanding and things that I have read about this, this is a very shallow layer of soil. And then underneath this shallow soil, there is a layer of rock underneath it. And so the soil has no depth to it. And anything that you plant into it is unable to grow adequate roots. And that is the problem noticed in the parable. Sometimes we read this and we think that the scorching sun is the problem, but I want you to reread that parable and notice within it that it is not the sun that killed the plants. And if you look at Jesus' explanation of the text, you see that that sun is representative of tribulation and persecution. It was not the sun that killed the plant. Really, when you begin to look at other scriptures and you consider tribulation, you consider persecution, you consider hardship, they make us stronger. They don't cause us to wither away. They don't cause us to die. It builds endurance within us. It builds character within us. It builds hope within us. And so when we consider hardships, they're intended to make us better, to make us stronger, to make us grow more in our trust and relationship with God. When we consider what they're intended to be, how we are intended to look at them, it is a loving father who is chastising his children so that they might become more holy, so that they might become more righteous. Within the parable, it's not the son that kills the plant. It's the lack of roots that kills the plant. It's the lack of becoming grounded. It is the instability. It's the lack of establishment so that when hardship comes without roots, without that ability to receive nourishment and water so needed for life, the plant dies. We do not want to be this soil. Scripture says that we need to be rooted and grounded in love in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 17. Paul makes a very similar point in Colossians 2 and verse 7 that the roots need to go deep into the love of Christ. He needs to be our strong, solid foundation so that we would not be like the unstable of 2 Peter 3, but rather like the stable where we are firmly grounded. Our building can go tall and we don't have to worry about it falling down. Our roots grow deep so that we are a tree who does, who does not have to worry about the hot sun because we are we are becoming enriched in the nutrients of the love of God. We are becoming rich in the nutrients of our Savior. We need to be a rooted people. That begins by being planted. You see that in the story of the, the parable of the sower. The story of these four soils. It begins by being planted. Planted. But it continues in this thought of remaining planted. It continues in this thought of maturing and growing up. We don't need to remain a seedling forever. We need to grow into an oak. We need to grow into this tree whose roots are anchored deeply, whose roots are, are spread out far. We need to grow up. We 
we need to mature. We need to remove that rock from our soil and continue growing in maturity. We need to be well anchored in our faith that extends into heaven, that extends to Jesus, that holds us in place. We do not want to be the rocky soil. Third, in verse 7, we find the thorny soil. And as Jesus explains this text, he says that these thorns are representative of the, the cares of the world and the riches of the world, the things of the world. This is one that we are very, very familiar with, I think, if you grow a garden that you have to look out for those weeds that are going to crop up and they are going to take the nutrients that your plant needs. They're going to take away from your plant so that now your plant is not going to do as well because it's taking the life that your plant needs. And that's what's happening within the story. The thorns consume what the plant needs for a life and they get all wrapped up around it. They're taking its nutrients and taking its life, choking it out. says that's what the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches do to us. They kill the plant. They leave no room for life. Look with me a couple of chapters back, or more than that I guess. Look with me back in Matthew 6. And verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Or God and mammon. Your translation may say God and possessions. The idea of God and the things of this world. If the things of this world are on your heart, your garden is full of thorns. It's full of weeds. It's full of these things that are going to choke the life out of you. Your garden is full of God. It's full of life. It's full of every blessing that God offers. And your garden cannot be full of both. No man can serve two masters, and if it's full of weeds, it leaves no room for the life that God offers. We will not know that if we will not give up our life. Jesus makes that point in Matthew 16 as he is describing the characters of of those who are worthy to be his disciples. His disciples must take up their cross. They must die. They must follow him. They must be like him. We, let's make that personal, we must be like him. And if we say, that's the plant in our garden, my soil is one that is growing that plant. And this love of worldly things is in my life. Guess what's being choked out of me? Guess what it is being ended? The life of God within me. The blessings that he offers. We cannot have God and the love of the world in our garden together. It does not work. We need to weed our soil. 
We need to get the love of the world out of our lives. Look with me over at 1 John. Look with me in 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 15. 1 John 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Notice once more, you have two polar opposites. You cannot have them together. If you love the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. Yet if you love the Father, his love is in you, then you cannot love the world. These things are mutually exclusive. They do not work together. And so continuing on, for all that is in the world... The desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We need to weed our garden. With that, let me make this is the first year that I have ever planted a garden. And I will tell you that I put hours of hard work here at the beginning to make sure that weeds were not going to grow in my garden. And I think all of the hard work that goes into that, and today, and the days going forward, I say, because I did all of that in the beginning, I'm never going to have to weed my garden. Because I did it all then. Those of you that garden know what a foolish thought that is. Because you know I didn't get every weed. I put a lot of work into it, but if I just let it sit, a weed is going to grow up in my garden. And then two, and three, and then before you know it, it's all weeds and no plants because it choked the life out of the garden. We do that sometimes, spiritually. We start off so strong. We put in so much effort. We do all of this work so that the weed not be yanked out of our garden, so the skin not be out of our lives. Then we let it sit. We get lazy. We stop caring. And little by little, we up in our garden. Day by day, each and every day, we need to get those weeds out of our garden. And those of you who have been gardening for many, many years will know this. By the roots, when you get it out. Next year, it gets a little bit easier. Yes, you have to fight weeds. They're going to grow back. But it gets a little bit easier. And the year after, it gets a little bit easier. Because you're getting more and more weeds out by roots. It gets easier, but we can never stop weeding our garden. We do not want to have thorny soil. Finally, in verse 8, Jesus addresses the good soil, the soil in which fruit will be born, the, the soil in which it's able to accept the seed. It's able to bear fruit. The reason that it 
is, it is able to, the reason it is good is because it's the opposite of everything that we have seen thus far. It has been plowed. It has been prepared. It has been made ready. Its depth is such that it's able to take the seed in, and that seed is able to become rooted. It's able to become established. And then that seed is paired for. It's taken care of as thorns are weeded out of it so that that plant is able to thrive and grow in soil that has been made ready. Are we good soil? Are our hearts prepared to accept the word of God? Will we allow our hearts to accept that seed to be rooted in us? Have we rooted the world? Out of our lives. Have we gotten those seeds out of our lives? What 